Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker, international award-winning writer, producer, and director. Tina Andrews is my guest today in honor of Women's History Month. Tina is an author, playwright, and multimedia visual artist as well, who is currently writing the book for the new musical, I'm Every Woman, the Shaka Khan musical, coming to the West End in London. After attending New York University, where she majored in theater, Tina appeared as an actress in over 100 film and television roles, including originating the role of Valerie Grant on Days of Our Lives in daytime television's first interracial romance. But it was the role of Kunta Kinti's girlfriend Aurelia in the acclaimed miniseries Roots, which led to an incredible relationship with her literary mentor, Alex Haley, the author Alex Haley. Together, they collaborated on the PBS miniseries, Alex Haley's Great Men of African Descent, which led Tina to selling her first script to Columbia Pictures. I've heard people say that Tina Andrews shattered the glass ceiling for the iconic roles she portrayed in the 1970s, paving the way to uh, for what we're able to see here in 2024. It is my pleasure to welcome back to the locker room, Tina Andrews. Hi, Tina. Hi, are Alan, you, how are you? <laughs> I am well. Where are you coming to us from? Are you in London? I am in London. I'm in my flat in London. Unfortunately, you're going to get the ugly kitchen view as opposed to the great <laughs> living room view. <laughs> but listen, I'm just happy to be here. Thanks for I, having me. I am thrilled that you're here. I am thrilled. Um, I couldn't really think of a better guest to celebrate Women's History Month. So speaking of women, who are some of those women in, in history who've had the most influence on who Tina Andrews is today? Oh, my God. There are, there are a few people, actually. Um, let's start with, I just wrote about her last week when I was sort of asked the same question. Um, Maya Angelou mm -hmm. had a huge impact on my life because, uh, you know, she and I met and we talked about how I should conduct myself in um, a meeting I was having with another icon uh, from history, Mrs. Coretta Scott King, with yeah. whom I was uh, with whom I was close, and uh, we became close. And um, she gave me so many insights into Mrs. King, and they all worked when I finally got a chance to meet her, and then in fact befriend her. So Maya is definitely uh, is definitely one. Um, I like Hillary Clinton as well. She's had an impact in terms of what she's been able to do politically. I'm loving uh, Kamala Harris these days. There are there are quite a few women. I've had um, some Hollywood women. One is gone now, Dawn Steele, who mm. was the first woman to run a. To, yeah, to I remember a Dawn. I remember yeah, Dawn. She ran Columbia Pictures. Um, she really had a, a huge impact on my career in that she literally took me by the hand and showed me the ropes. I mean, she gave me that that classic line, there's no crying in show business. You know, that line from, there was a line similar in the, in the Tom Hanks movie, No Crying in Baseball, because I broke down into tears in the middle of a meeting and she got after me for that. And then she she literally just sort of mentored me. It was a great relationship. So I've had wonderful relationships with women in my life and career. Do you enjoy mentoring yourself? Uh, mentoring other, actually other people. They don't necessarily have to be women, but for the most part, they're, they are. Uh, yeah. Uh, my niece is someone that I'm sort of taking under my wing now. Uh, Rachel is... Uh, wants to be a writer and i have been helping her with her her material um there are a couple of people in my life that i just adore who ask me questions about things that i'm hoping that i'm i'm here to answer um denise gilman karen um jordan um and then there's uh uh joanne morris i mean there's so there's so many besides Dawn, uh, Dawn Steele, are there other women who've had a, a great impact on your career? Stephanie Elaine was one. 
I have a dear friend, Wendy Cram, who was one. I have a new, now new friend um, who came to me from HBO, Kayla Barnes. Um, there are so, there are so, so men, my God, I, almost, almost all women, uh, actually, when I, when I think about it, not so many here in London. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, there, um, it, it turns out that most of the people that I'm doing business with here are, are men. But um, there have been some wonderful directors, too, in Hollywood. Nima Barnett is one. There are a lot of women. There are a lot of women. I love that. Well, well yeah, my speaking, life has been very impacted by women. Speaking of influential women, you're currently writing the book for I'm Every Woman, the Shaka Khan musical. What can you tell us about the new show and what uh, prompted you to jump on board? Uh, well, it's Shaka. Shaka and I are, are two women from the South side of Chicago. And we're in the same age range. We're within two years um, of each other's age. And she's a tiny little thing. You know, I'm only five feet. She's only five feet. Although we have been swearing up and down that she's like five feet and a half an inch. <laughs> but two powerful, small women. Um, the project came to me uh, from a wonderful producer here who did the Michael Jackson um, Thriller Live show mm -hmm. that stayed on the West End for 12 years, um, whose name is Adrian Grant. And he called me one day here. We were, we were trying to find things to do together. And I get this phone call out of the blue a uh, year ago, November. And he said, you know, I, I know that you, you write musicals. I know that you write plays. I'm thinking about doing Shaka Khan. And I stopped him in mid sentence. And I said, if you are calling me to ask me if, 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 if you want me to work on that show with you, the answer is yes, I'm there. I will do it. I know her life. I know her story. I even used to dress in the leather in those days when I would show my midriff. Like <laughs> I clearly don't anymore. <laughs> but when, <laughs> but when I did, I would wear that the leather with the crisscross and the feathers in the hair, and I did the whole. I feel like thing. your hair is giving me shaka right now. <laughs> right now, yeah, we look like. I have a wonderful picture. I wish I could show you of she and I together. A uh, great picture that was taken a year ago, February. And we met in Beverly Hills and just started talking about what she would want to see in a story about her life. And that went on for maybe three hours. And I have it all on tape. Oh, wow. There are some things that came out. I will not go into it on this show right now. But there are some, there are some events in her life which were unbelievable that happened to her that she had told no one she had buried it uh emotionally for 40 years and in that conversation um it came out and and then she got up and ran off now we're in a, a, a you know this big table she runs off to the bathroom to cry her sister runs off to the bathroom after her and i'm sitting there and i'm going oh now what do we do <laughs> <laughs> oh my I, I really was very nervous and when she came back in she said you're like Barbara Walters you just make people cry when you interview them <laughs> so I said you realize that this would be very dramatic to show in a in a in a piece um of course the the exploitive side of me would want to explore it in the in the material but I will not do it if you do not want me to do it because it's really it, it, you know it, i i was very concerned about it and she said now that it's out it's out and i said i'm gonna call you tomorrow and um and ask you again after you've slept on it but she had given me the entire story and as i when i went home of course and we're talking la because i was we were you know i was in this meeting was in beverly hills i went to my place in la and as I'm sort of charting out what I would want to use in the piece, I had this gap and I said, if she says yes, then I'll do this. And the next day I did call her and I said, please make sure that you are okay with this. If you are not, trust me, 
will work around it. And she said, no, go with God. So Alan, you can imagine after the the entire book was written and we went into a workshop last uh, last year, just this, just November of this past year, she came and was sitting right next to me. And I said, oh my God, I hope I don't trigger her. <laughs> I hope it doesn't trigger her. Is, is that scary for you to have oh, her next to you watching your story? First of all, I have never done a piece where the subject of the work is still alive <laughs> and sitting next to me watching it for the first time. Remember, I'm the girl that does people that have been dead 200 <laughs> yeah. years. <laughs> That's very true. Yeah, you're right. Dead 200 <laughs> years. I mean, the closest was Frankie Lyman, and he had been dead 50 years, you know, <laughs> so, so, um, I was, I, I was, I really was, I, I was feeling it on the other side. So Shaka was on this side of me and Beverly Knight, the singer was on, who's doing sister act now on the West End. She's oh, wow. sitting on this side of me and I'm going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And it went beautifully. So I, so I mean, that was maybe one of the scariest moments I would think now in my in my career is to have the the person that you've written about sitting next to you and you don't know whether they're going to a like your work or like their portrayal of themselves, you know, because for a lot of people, it's about revisionist history. So um, yeah, I was nervous and it, thank God it, it worked out. So. We go back, I do some more rewriting, and then we'll go on a short tour in England, and then we come into the West End. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Best of luck. Um, uh, some fans were saying you haven't aged a day. Trey <laughs> said you haven't aged a day. And <laughs> Rook said, hello, Tina, you are beautiful. And Chicago ladies don't play. <laughs> Chicago ladies don't play. <laughs> Listen, lesson learned from our dear Miss Shaka Khan. I I, re I really do wish that I could email you the picture and you could put it up somehow. Well, you can send it to me later and I'll share it uh, on social media. For, okay, for fans. that's great. I mean, it's, well, you know I blasted it on social media. Yeah, but fans will love love to see it. Well, let's yeah. go back to Chicago. I, yeah. I heard you say that your parents encouraged you to voice your opinions. You know, when you think back, to growing up with mom and dad, and I think your brother, are there any conversations at home that stand out in your mind where you all sort of shared opinions? I remembered my father saying, make sure that I got an education so that I would have something to fall back on. The fallback you know, situation is always, is very nerve wracking for me. And I had applied to NYU. The deal was I was, either going to be in show business or I was going to be a history professor. I, I told you that, you know, the last time we spoke, how much I enjoy history. I always have. So, uh, and that was my minor. Well, um, and, was there something that sparked that interest? Was I, I don't recall. Was there like a, a period in history that you were fascinated with or just I, all know, history? I, I don't, Alan, it's hard to say. I just was good at it. I remember facts and things. Listen, the minutia that I know about the British monarchy. So I said, why do I know about King James the First? Where's Kate? Why do I know about George Washington? What, what is wrong with me? Where's Princess Kate? <laughs> well, now that's the question for the ages, isn't it? We don't know here. And I'm on this side of the pond. And I said, girl, where are you? <laughs> Come on out. So um, I don't, I love history. I just loved it. And, and so I can tell you that I got the best of both worlds. I am a history teacher and I do it through entertainment. That was the conversation that I had with my, with Dr. Maya Angelou, when she said, you must continue to do what you do because you are telling our history in a very entertaining way. And it makes people go to the internet and to their history books to look up what is and is not true about what it is you presented. And she honored me by, I, that was an honor, her saying that to me. Uh, in terms of um, my dad, my mom and my brother, I, I will tell you, Alan, that it is all my brother's fault that I decided 
to come and live in London for, you know, most of the year. He gave me, um, he gave me some great advice. He said, do not wait on the studios. Don't wait on a project. Don't wait on anyone to, um, to give you your, your dream or to make that manifest. You make that manifest. You've been talking about living in England for 40 years. So when you go over, just carry some trunks and some suitcases and ship some stuff over. If you love it, you'll, you know, you'll stay. If you don't, you'll ship all that stuff back. <laughs> Clearly I'm still here. <laughs> Clearly. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. love that. What led you into dance at such an early age? Oh, Alan, I can dance. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. That's a good answer. It yeah, was as it. simple as that. A yeah, girl good. knew how to move, you know. So I um I, I'm a white boy who knows how to dance. I, I love to dance. Well, so. I knew how to dance, and 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 everybody made a big point of letting me know that I could dance. I remember I was the first dancer that danced with the Ruth Page uh ballet company in Chicago. And in fact, great story. My neighbor who lives for four blocks away and I met at a Japanese restaurant, which is two blocks in the other direction. She was there with her husband. We met in this place and started chatting. She's from Chicago. And as we're talking, her husband's British, she's American. And as we're talking, she said, well, you know, I used to dance. Uh, I started dancing in Chicago when I was a teenager. Uh, and I, I would do the Nutcracker every year at McCormick Place. And I said, stop, 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 stop. I danced in the Nutcracker every year <laughs> at McCormick Place. And she said, well, I dance with Ruth Page. And I said, I dance with Ruth Page. <laughs> and she said, oh, my God, did we dance together? I said, well, girl, you would have remembered me. I was the brown skin one. <laughs> In we London, are best friends in now London. with 50 years in between. Do you believe that? Wow. Yeah. So I'm going to write a short story about that. But clearly she and I had this entire history together and we didn't remember <laughs> each other. <laughs> 50 years goes by and we meet in England in a Japanese restaurant and now we're besties. It is the most fabulous story. I was just at the theater to see I her mean, husband really, you last know, night. The... the Coining the term "small world" is so. It really it, that those things are they happen all the time. What? How did the transition into acting come from dance? Um, that was easy. I, first of all, Debbie Allen and I have had this conversation. Dancers make the best transitions into whatever they want to be following dance. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, I'm only five feet tall. So I wasn't going to have a huge dance career in New York. Here I was thinking I was a going to be either the next Maria Talchi or current Misty Copeland. And it didn't happen for two reasons. One, I closed the car door on my foot, broke my toe, walked around on it for four days and didn't tell my dad. Ouch. And the doctor said it would never knit back together. So my, my left um, baby toe never healed properly where I was going to be able to dance in the point shoes again. And number two, I get to New York and I'm a little too tiny to be in the chorus. Chorus dancers are all between five foot six and five eight. So I obviously that, you know, that didn't work. And I remember being told you either have to become a principal dancer or you're going to have to do Broadway and, and not do it. Won't, it won't be ballet or, or you should try acting. And I figured I'll try anything. So I started going up for commercials or whatever. And I always have looked younger than my actual age. So in those days, I looked like a kid. So there was plenty of work for me because I was 18 and looked 11. You know, so I had I anywhere between 11 and 18. I, that was my spot and I filled it. And then I was cast in Hello, Dolly. With, you know, with just two, you know. Not Icons. really. <laughs> Icons. I mean, Cab Calloway and Pearl Bailey. And Pearl Bailey and Miss Bailey. It's funny. I have. To, I still call. I have to call her Miss Bailey. That was you know that. Yeah, 
So Miss Bailey um, said to me, and I auditioned, you know, for for a um, a chorus role that required the character to be short. And I heard it from the back of the theater. And she said, darling, can you read lines? And I was told, say yes to everything. Can you ride a horse? Yes. Can you <laughs> play tennis? Yes. Can you read lines? Yes. And they gave me the sides and told me to go backstage and learn the lines and come back when I was ready. And I did and got the role. So my first Broadway show was Ermengarde in Hello, Dolly. So that made that transition quite easy. That's, I mean, an incredible, <laughs> an incredible first show. And, and then you take the show on the road and you end up on, you know, the national tour comes to Los Angeles. Right. And, and, and tell us about the agent in the audience. Oh, yeah. So I told, all right, I told you, I've told you this before. I, I know no, no, no. I, I, I was, my research, I heard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's opening night. People come backstage and one of them was an agent who said she became my first agent. She said, are you represented on the West Coast? I said, I'm not represented anywhere. anywhere. I got this show from reading Backstage Magazine in New York. So yeah, I'm not represented. She said, come to my office if you can tomorrow. And I think I can get work for you. You look so young. There'll be plenty of these teenage roles for you to do, especially since you're over 18. And I said, okay. <laughs> and I show up at her office. We opened on a Tuesday. Th that next day was Wednesday, Thursday. I'm staying with my aunt who happened to live in LA. I'm staying with her. Phone rings. And my aunt says, it's some lady named Cumber. And I said, oh, Lil Cumber, who's dead now, but she was one of the first black agents. And uh, it was an audition for the Brady Bunch. And I'm thinking it was my favorite show on television. No way I'm going to get this role having never done television, never been in front of a camera before, really. And I go to this audition and walked through the door and and had in those days, my hair parted down the center and these two giant Afro puffs, which is what they call it. I look like Mickey Mouse. Just, <laughs> ah. And I delivered what are now the, na the now famous line, gee, Marsha, do you really think we can get Davy Jones to sing at our prom? And I got a, what's called a callback. So it meant that I went the next day. So now we're talking Thursday. Friday, I got the job. Monday, I was in front of the camera. In one of the probably most seen episodes of that series, because it was Davy Jones. <laughs> Davy Jones of the of the monkeys. Of the monkeys. Know, of the monkeys. Yeah. Um, it was it was absolutely a terrific experience for me. But because I'd been on that show and it was so popular, of course, she started getting phone calls. Hey, where is that girl with those big Afro puffs? We want her for Room 222 and the Mod Squad and, you know, the, the Rookies and all of those little 70s shows. I was doing it playing 11, 12, 13, 14 years. I said, when am I ever going to grow up? And that's why Jodie Foster and I ended up doing a movie that I, we neither of us should have done, but we both wanted to play adults so badly. So but, like, you know, I want to play somebody 20. And and not only you said it, Brady Bunch was your favorite show. So like your first show, at, you know, out there is one of your favorite shows. I mean, doesn't get better. Doesn't, doesn't get better, get than, better than, that. than that. So once again, you know, you send for your stuff. <laughs> it all comes in boxes. <laughs> and I moved to California. The weather was great. And, and I said, boy, the opportunities are frequent here and an agent now and I have an apartment and and the career started and it's been um it's been a steady climb since and, and you were the first black woman in a primetime series is that correct at that time prime, uh I I was the first black woman on daytime television the first black woman in an interracial relationship 
and the first black woman to have the I had the first interracial. Oh, yes. right, but I think it was the first person of color on that series on on the Brady Bunch. Oh, you mean on the Brady Bunch? Yeah. Oh, there was no question. There were there there yeah. were no black people on that show. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I I did it for that. And you know how we all used to be, Alan. It would be funny. It would echo throughout, you know, black neighborhoods. Black folks on TV. Oh my God! Turn on Channel Seven. Black people on TV. <laughs> yeah. Which is really a shame, but you know, we all want to see each other represented. So of course, there's excitement when that happens. Take take us back to Salem and days of our lives. What do you remember about that audition and and hearing about the role of Valerie Grant? Oh, interesting. I, I cannot, oh, I cannot remember the audition. Isn't that funny? No, it's, it, I, it's, I really it's, it's one or two years ago. <laughs> I can't remember the audition. I remember being told that they wanted me to do it. So I cannot remember whether or not I, I don't remember if I had a callback or how many. Did callbacks. you know that they wanted an interracial romance coming no, in? No, no, no. We were just there. I was playing a, a nurse, and I was just there to nurse the lead white character back to health. He had amnesia. He had run off, and he, he got into an accident. And I was nursing him back to health. The show had just gone to one hour. All the soap operas used to be a half an hour. Mm -hmm. And one by one, they all changed to an hour. And so they needed more characters to fill out the hour and chose to then bring on a black family. So I didn't even have a contract. I was only supposed to have been there maybe six months or so. Wow. But what happened is Richard was a pretty good looking guy. And it was very easy to work with Richard Guthrie, who was playing David Banning. Well, look at and, this. Yeah. And we had this wonderful uh, chemistry. I loved, I loved working with him. And, um, and so we kind of found ourselves in, in our personal lives, you know, you know, things were bleeding over from the show into, into real life. And so the writers were, they were picking up on something going on between us. And then the next thing you know, um, a, a script came in that said he takes her hand and doesn't let it go. And then I thought, oh, this is where they're going with this. And I said, boy, Richard, are you game? And so he said, hey, man, let's go for it. And then we became the, one of the number one couples on daytime. It was us and uh, the, the, that couple on General Hospital. Wow. Yeah, um, so it was... Those were fun days when they were fun. And then when they stopped being fun, they really weren't fun because, you know, my fan mail turned when we talk, yeah, to talk, talk about that. I well, mean, we, it, it was did you expect it? I'm sorry. Did you expect it? Did it hit you hard? You know, what, 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 you know, it wasn't seen before really on TV. So were you anticipating uh, I, I was crushed by what people would say to me and about me in fan mail. Um, it was okay as long as I was tending to his health. The moment it started looking as though we were going into what would be a relationship, uh, the, the Bible Belt and the Midwest really, uh, they, 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 they really didn't like it. And... So then sacks of fan mail started to come in, but they weren't the, oh, we love you, send us a picture, blah, blah. It was, you know, I was called the N-word. I was told that I need to go back to Chicago. I need to stay off of television. It was, it was hard for me. And then one fine day, Richard and I were doing press in Florida, and this guy walked right up to the table, and he had a pitcher of water, and he just poured it on my head. <laughs> And I, I was in shock and Richard was too at the same hotel. Cause this is the restaurant in a hotel. Pernell Roberts, who used to be on, on Bonanza was yeah. happened to be having lunch a couple of tables over and how heroic he jumped up and 
punch the guy. It was, it was very, that's how I met and became friends with Purnell uh, because of that. But I was having bad experiences as a result of the relationship. And when we kissed for the first time, which was a show that aired on a Friday, 5,000 letters came into the network. So eventually I was the one who was let go, not him. So I was let go. So of course, when my character was let go, they got rid of the entire black family. So it was, it was kind of sad. And, and, but they did it in a, there was a slow meandering death. Um, they gave me a contract for another series on the same network. So then it could be said that, well, Tina's leaving the show because she's going to do a primetime series, which everybody, you know, of course, understood. But it was one of those series that they knew they were going to just write off because the star of that show, which was Red Fox, they were giving him something to satisfy his contract. They never had any intention of, 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 of it being a long term show. So I was gone. And that's what happened to me. But that's when my dad said to me. You are at the mercy of every writer, every producer, every director, because you are an actress. You know, five, 10,000 actresses can play Juliet, but only one Shakespeare wrote Juliet. You need to go back to your, you know, original love, which was of, you know, for writing. That was the time I started planting those seeds to become a writer. I love that story about your dad. I, I, I just love you know, it takes that one pearl of wisdom to set you on a course that really he changed the, you know, right? He changed the trajectory at that moment. He changed the trajectory certainly of my career because I thought I was going to be, you know, an on-camera bunny for the rest of my career. You know, I thought, okay, I'll turn 30, I'll play 30-year-olds. I turn 50, I'll play 50-year-olds. So, uh, but that was, that was not the case. It made it better because I am more in control and in charge of my life. I'm here in London now. I can write from anywhere. So I, I'm here. I write here. I go back to LA. I write there. It doesn't matter. I write on planes. In fact, I'm seriously, I take so many trains here in um, England going from, say, London to, to Edinburgh or to um, Liverpool or to Manchester, Birmingham, Leicester, Bath. Um, that I'm seriously thinking about writing a book called, you know, writing on trains. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. But yeah, I love, I mean, I think that's such a great story. Well, well, speaking of writers, um, your mentor, Alex Haley, in 1977, you, you joined the miniseries Roots. What did it mean, first of all, to be a part of that historic series and, and getting to, you know, work with him to work with him <laughs> to be on that show well I'll, I'll tell you how that happened uh, the, the book had become a sensation there's no question i uh he just passed away two years ago and i was very saddened by that the director of the episode that i did had used me three times before and he always said listen you know if i got anything that you can remotely do I'm just going to send it to your agent for you. So I never, ever had to audition for John Ehrman. I loved John Ehrman. Um, and he sent a script and he said, there are two roles, pick one. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> and so I did. And once I was cast and we were on the set, you know, you become those characters. And people like Vic Morrow were having a difficult time using, you know, the language that, that slave masters would use at the time or being harsh. I mean, we'd all be friends during lunch and whatever, and then we'd have to go on camera. And it was just difficult to, it was just, it was hard. It was hard. And um, Lou Gossett had to, to say exactly what years later, Samuel L. Jackson had to say to, um, um, Oh, 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 who was it that did uh, Django Unchained? Um, so he said, look, just it's another Tuesday for us. Just say the word. Let's get it done. <laughs> you know, so um, we became those characters. And when they were beating Kunta Kinte um, and we're looking at that, suddenly it was as though my ancestors 
filled me. Their spirits came, you know, within all of us, all of our ancestors were, were there. And Alex was weeping off camera in watching that particular episode because it really looked as if they were really hurting LeVar, even, you know, the, it wasn't real rope, it was foam, you know, it was all of that, but everyone's, everyone went there with the acting. And I remember thinking, gosh, I've got to write like this. How do you, I mean, where do you, how do you get the skill to write like this? And I asked Alex about his journey. And he said, come to a, a talk I'm giving at 20th Century Fox. I'm going to be talking about exactly the journey to Roots. And I saw him on stage talk about it. And I then said, I got to be like him. I got to be able to do that. He, he was masterful. It was like a one man show. And he talked about what he went through to get to that a that character and to find his roots and the disconnect between America and Africa and being on the ship and wanting to commit suicide and all it was just masterful his journey and he and I became friends and so much later when I was ready to take myself seriously as a writer he said I'm doing a PBS project do you have a sample I sent him my Bob Marley story and I sent him Sally Hemings. And he called me and said, you're hired. Let me fly you down here to, to Tennessee and let's work on this project together. And we worked on the project for four months and then he died. <laughs> so um, Alex Haley is one of those bright shining lights that um, came into my life and left. He was there when, you know, at the beginning for Roots and the phenomenon that was Roots. Mm -hmm. And then in the 90s, when he was now producing this show and contacted me, he became the reason that I got produced as a writer because he was the person who then introduced me to the head of the then head of Columbia Pictures, Don Steele. And, and wow. off my writing career went, you know, he dies, but she, she then becomes, she, you she know, took a, you. Yeah, yeah. She, she became the next mentor. You know, when you think of Alex, I mean, I'm sure just spending that time working on the PBS thing, you know, you, I'm sure you learned every minute you were with him, but is there a particular lesson from, from maybe just listening to him or even watching him that, that has stayed with you, uh, you know? Perseverance. Mm -hmm. He said, you gotta, <laughs> said, you have to be like those snowmen that are on the lawn at Christmas time, they're blown up. And then if you punch them, they fall over, but then they roll back up. <laughs> he said, you gotta be that snowman. <laughs> Take a punch, fall over, but you gotta get, you gotta get back up. He told me that it wasn't going to be easy. That it was going to be this hard. But then when it finally happens, you know, I, the last time we spoke, we we had a we had a lot to talk about this. Charlotte Sophia, yeah, yeah, this book. Mm -hmm. So this was eight years never thought I was going to finish it. Kept coming here to London back and forth to do the research. There was a big gap in the middle of it. Could not connect because it was missing history. Couldn't connect whole sections of, of Queen Charlotte's life. And then I'm thinking, oh my God. And then I came here one year and it I think Tina froze. Did she freeze for everybody else? Hey folks, did she freeze for everybody else? She did. Uh, let me...
Okay, so let's see if we can get her back. She froze. How's everybody's Friday? She is fascinating. Tina was a guest to talk about her book, Charlotte Sophia, I think a year or two ago. And I, I loved speaking with her and I hope she, um, so I'm really glad she could be here for International Women's Month, uh, Women's History Month, not international. Um, but she is a remarkable woman, remarkable, with a fascinating career and um, love everything she's doing. Let's hope she, her internet comes back and we can get her back. Anybody have big plans for the weekend? Any questions for me? I agree, Tony. She's met and worked with an incredible array of talented men and women. And I'm so glad her father told her to, you know, pursue writing because she has certainly succeeded. Hopefully we'll get her back. We'll see what happens. Horrible what happened to her uh, at that restaurant. Horrible. Hate has no place. Let's see if... Uh, I think she lost the internet. Um, so we'll, we might try and do a part two, everybody. Um, she's definitely having trouble. So uh, let me say goodbye to all of you. And I will try to reschedule uh, some extra time with Tina, maybe uh, sometime this month. But thank you all for joining us today. Oh, wait, she's back. She's back. She's back. She's back. <laughs> it's pouring rain here. The internet's been out all day. Yeah, the, the rain can do that. Um, but you were saying how he helped you with Charlotte Sophia. I think that's where we were. Yeah, this, just in terms of perseverance. Yeah. That all of a sudden I remembered him when he said he looked out over the ocean and his ancestors came to him and said, you can do it, you can do it, you'll find that missing link. And it was the same with me when I came here to find that missing link in that gap in my story. And it turns out that all I really had to do was smash where the hole was together and lace it with the fact that um, St. James Palace was not the gorgeous palace that I had written about, but was in fact, you know, a little dull. And, and change up Charlotte's reaction when she comes from Germany. So instead of her saying, oh, what a great place I'm going to live in, it becomes, oh, my heavens, this cannot be <laughs> where I'm going to live. It and are you literally... turning? Was that are simple? You, are you turning Charlotte Sophia into a series? Into a film. Into a film. Into a film. Because it's already a series. Oh, it, it, it is a series already. Yeah, someone someone beat me to it. Oh, okay, okay. Because yeah, I knew you called, were going it's to do it. Bridgerton. Gotcha. <laughs> yes, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Because I was reading on your 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 website. That's so funny. Um, how did you become uh, fascinated with Sally Hemings? My dad again. I you know what a loss that was when he when he passed. My dad used to tell the story about his elder cousin living across the way in Watsika, Illinois from another woman who had claimed to be a descendant of Sally and Tom. And um, when 
he was then telling me, you're at the mercy of producers and directors and networks and all of that for you to get a job as an actress. You need to go back to writing. In that conversation, he said, you know, you can tell some stories that will be uplifting, stories that we don't know about. Um, he said, like I, I was telling you about my cousin and and her living across the way from a descendant of Thomas Jefferson and Sally. And he called her Henning, actually, not Hemings. He mispronounced her name. And I said, Dad, the president had a, he had children with the slave and Daddy said that he owned. And I thought, wow. And that's when I first started to go into some research about it because I thought, look at the difficulty I was having in an interracial relationship on daytime television. Imagine how people would feel if they knew that the president of the United States back in the day, who was a slaveholder, owned a slave that he had some affection for, who happened to be the half wife, a half, uh, half sister of his dead wife. I thought, okay, well, this is up my soap opera alley. <laughs> and well, so, and you mentioned research. I mean, you didn't just do a little research. You interviewed how many descendants? Oh my God, by the end of the day, 66. And they all showed up. Now keep in mind, um, and this is before the, the, the uh, this is before I sold it. Once it became a series for CBS, I knew that I had to honor as many descendants as possible. No one was going to give a, a rap party or no one was giving a, no one was going to give any a, a party at all. I was just thinking, oh, this thing is going to just go out on the air. So I decided, no, I'd spend my own money. Let's rent a place in, um, uh, in, um, oh, where, where were they all? South, not South Carolina. I'll think of it in a minute. Um, Chillicothe, so in Ohio. So let's go to Ohio and let's invite uh, two or 300 people and and I'll give a party and say a little something and we'll screen the Sally Hemings piece. Alan, we couldn't go, we couldn't do it at the restaurant that Madison Hemings had actually built the stairs for because they said, we have fire laws. We can only allow 150 people in here. So, we had to find another place to have this screening and to have this this big to do. Ohio State University said, we will give you our auditorium if you will allow us to produce two one hour documentaries on Sally and Tom. And I said, wow, two one hour documentaries and you get this thousand seat auditorium and they were going to have you know outside of the, the the doors there they would have you know a table and food and all of that alan the 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 i'm coming i'm coming they people pass pass around the rsvps so those same two or three hundred people that i was inviting turned into 800 800 descendants of thomas jefferson and sally hemmings came to that screening and we had everybody, we had yellow tags if you were an Eston Hemings descendant, a green tag if you were Madison, you know, and, a, and another color if you if you were uh, descended from, so the Eston, uh, Madison, Beverly, um, John, uh, 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 we had different color codes for the, for the descendants. Wow. And it was something to behold. And uh, of course, when CBS found out that I was doing that and that the guest list had risen to that degree, then they said, oh, no, 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 listen, we, Tina, <laughs> we'll send CBS this morning down for coverage. We'll do the PR. We will take care of all of this. Don't, don't worry. So it turns out that I ultimately didn't write the check for it, that they came in and they, and they took care of it. And it was a glorious, glorious event. Um, and that story is still resonating with people because they found Sally's room at Monticello. So that, that story is a, is a gift that keeps on giving. There was, um, of course, a Pulitzer Prize winning book called The Hemmings of 
Monticello that came out that was written by uh, Annette Gordon-Reed. So people are still talking about it, and I'm thinking about um, re-exploring um, yeah, other sides of that story. Been, that screening must have been something with all of it. The it was, uh, my mother was alive, and I was so happy that she uh, was, was there to experience it with me. And then an, an odd thing happened in that when I, in the middle of me giving a speech to everyone, thanking them for coming, my father walked into the room in the back in wearing his green, he had a favorite green raincoat that he used to love to wear. My dad walked in and I stopped talking and he smiled and then went away. Wow. I have had two odd experiences in my life. That was one where he just walked in and stood there. It could have been somebody else standing there who looked like him, but he stood there. He smiled at me, you know, that I'm so proud of you smile. And then just became diaphanous and faded away. So um, I told mom, I said, I said, mom, daddy showed up. And she said, that would make sense, wouldn't it? Because you spent all his money doing your re doing re because remember, you know, I had not become successful as a writer in the previous 16 years, 16 year <laughs> run up to that getting made. So wow. I was forever calling dad saying, dad, you know, could you send me another thousand dollars? I need to go over here. And, this, he said. <laughs> and every time, every time he would send a check. Because I used to get him by saying, dad, if you don't send the money, you know, I'll have to go out in the streets and be a street walker. So you don't want me to. <laughs> You don't want me to embarrass the family in that way. No, where's the nearest Western Union? Here's some money. I mean, it, there's really nothing you don't do. You know, 2009, you you uh, went into art and ha have, you know, an artist. You're selling pieces that you create. I don't even know where you find the time to do all of these things. They're on the wall. <laughs> had, had we been doing this on the other computer facing in that direction... <laughs> The art is all up on, I shipped quite a bit of it here. Um, what Alan, led you I, into that? Well, that was the second experience that I had. Um, I had a cancer scare in 2009. And so they found something in my spine. And, um, you know, they always have to tell you what the worst of it could be. <laughs> And I'm thinking, okay, we're not going to be happy with that result. So I just have to really <laughs> pray that. So he said, I've done seven of these, and generally I can get the the, the tumor out cleanly. It, it's it looks it's a marble, but it's on a bed of nerves. So it's like a marble sitting on vermicelli. And if I nick one, you'll be paralyzed. And I was thinking, okay, that uh, that that's not going to work for me. <laughs> that's not going to work for me. And so they put you out to have the surgery. My brother had flown into New York um, and people were with me. And he had said, I'm going to ask you in recovery if you can wiggle your, wiggle your toes. And if you can, I will not have nicked you and you, you'll probably be able to leave the hospital in six, seven days. While I was under, and people say that, no, there's no brain activity, nothing. My spirit left my body and came here to London to the Tate Modern. It's my favorite, favorite um, um, art gallery museum of all time. And I, I go all the time. Every time there's an exhibit of somebody, you know, I'm, I'm there. My spirit then crossed the Millennium Bridge and you know, the Tate is on the other side of the Thames. It crossed the Millennium Bridge and went into the building where I had an audience with something. I can't describe it other than it was, again, it was diaphanous. So it was cloudy and not formed. So it was like a cloud, you know, it was like a cloud or energy. And the voice was not male or female. And it asked me, had I done everything I wanted to do? And I remember saying, oh, I would have loved to have done some more painting. You know, in the 70s, I had a lot of blue paint and I, that was my blue period. And I had a lot of paintings on the wall that were all blue. And I enjoyed that. I don't know why I ever stopped. 
And then whatever it was, I call it the entity. It could have been St. Peter. It could have been God. It could have been guardian angel. Could have been, I, I don't know, but it was in the light. Whatever it was, was in the light. And it said, well, maybe you should go back and paint again. And the next thing I know, I'm curled back into my body. And I hear, Tina, Tina. And it's my doctor. I'm in recovery. And he asked, can you wiggle your toes? And I, I, I'm thinking I'm doing it. And I said, are they wiggling? And he said, yes, yes. I left the hospital six days later. My brother drove me. There was a Michael's <laughs> art store. Yeah, I know Michael. All the way, all the way to my to my my home in in in, 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 in the Hamptons at the time. And I said, Donald, stop! We have to go. We have to go in here. And he said, I got to get you home to eat so you can get in bed. I said, Yeah, we have to stop. I bought paint and easels and and uh, um, canvas and brushes and all of that, and we put it in the car. And I came home, and I've been painting ever since. Wow! And by the it way, only three of the paintings are in blue. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that is uh, that's how it happened. There was this I had an experience that led me back to uh, this well, that, and that's a long it. time from the 70s to 2009. That is exactly right. So, you know, there's always these things that happen to me and there's a 50 year gap in between. <laughs> Seriously, that incredible. But it's something you absolutely enjoy. Do you have a favorite piece? I do. Unfortunately, I can't show it to you. My 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 two favorite pieces are here. Uh, one is in the hallway here. The other one is red, and it's upstairs. Um, I think I was very heavily influenced by Jackson Pollock and Franz Klein. Um, uh, there, I like a lot of I like a lot of people's work, but I'm not a representational artist. I'm definitely an abstract expressionist. But I do. The, the pieces that I brought here are the ones that I want to be able to look at every day. If I'm going to write to the degree that I do in LA, then I, I, my surroundings have to, to, to be things that are meaningful and important to me. So both my paintings and my sculptures are here. Love that. With, with everything you've written, the plays, the books, screenplays, is there one that holds a dear place in your heart the most? Two, the play on Sally Hemings mm -hmm. and my play on Queen Charlotte Sophia. You know, uh, when you write a play and when you write a book, it is the freest experience. It is also the most personal because they're not people who will tell you what to do in those two and those two artistic expressions when you write movies when you write television you have a lot of people in it a lot of cooks in the kitchen a lot and but then when it's time for them to pan whatever you've written then of course those people will be gone and there you are sitting there saying but wait a minute he told me to do that and she told me to do that um writing books and writing theater is the the best most honest and um, most satisfying artistic expression for me in terms of the written word. And so my plays are pretty significant because they are everything I want to say in the piece. And then it's just a question of hiring the, the most divine right actors to say those lines and become the embodiment of what you have written. So yeah, so it would be Sally Hemings, the play, and um, Charlotte Sophia the play Love and that. i'm going to try to get charlotte sophia up while i'm here in england oh why not why not yeah. Yeah. and uh knowing you you will um if somebody watching wants to follow in your footsteps writing what's the best piece of advice you would tell somebody finish <sighs> oh my god i've got so many friends who want to be writers and they stop somewhere in the middle. Oh, they get the thing, you know, they get it going. Maybe they get act one going. And then somewhere around page 50, 
you know, I, I, so I'm talking, I said, listen, wasn't I talking to you about that same project three years ago? Yeah, but you know, I'm still, I'm still working on it. I'm still working on it. And they said, well, remember it took you eight years to finish your piece. And I said, yeah, but I finished <laughs> That manuscript was 670 something pages when I finished the original Queen Charlotte. And then I had to whittle it down only for this, you know, the, 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 the draft that they have published here in England. The one I just showed you is 500 and something. I mean, it's enormous. I could tell when you picked it up before. Oh my um, God. I, I'm thinking of my friend, Jill Laurie Hurst, who it, used to write for Guiding Light when uh, we were there together. And I know she's got things she's working on. So I hope she heard you say, finish. Finish. <laughs> finish. And, and here's the thing. Here's the thing. It doesn't have to be good. It doesn't have to, it does it absolutely does not have to be perfect. You have to finish it. Get all of your thought. The best advice is to not edit as you go, get everything out of you and get it on the page because the real writing is in the rewriting. Then you're going to shift things around. I'm still old school where I, where I like to take, I have a, a, a listen, it was it, this red pen. I like to draw squares and say, move this up to here. This is a great line. We established this earlier. I tear up those first drafts. And then when I, maybe I think three drafts later, that's the draft. Interesting. So it's like giving birth. You know, it's a very painful process. <laughs> yes. But once the baby's here and has all his arms and legs and fingers, it's a really satisfying thing. I you do know, love being a writer. It's a so, yes, it's a solitary life when you're in the doing of it. But I allow myself to finish either a chapter or certainly in the case of what I'm doing now, I'm putting together the six episodes of a limited series that I'm going to be doing here in, in, in England for a British company. Every time I finish one of those sections, I get to treat myself like a puppy. So I, I tell people, if you want to finish, you have to allow yourself to do something you really want to do only after you finish certain sections. So I like to shop. I also like that club that's three doors down, Archer Street. Hi, Archer Street. <laughs> Hi, guys. I love that. You know, I mean, I'm going to ask this question, but I mean, is there anything you haven't done you still want to do? You've done everything. And you do everything, not that you've done, you do. Uh, it, okay, so Alan, it, it, this may not necessarily be an artistic thing, but it would turn into it would turn into, into some sort of an artistic thing. I, I travel for work a lot. <clears throat> I do not travel for pleasure. And I am in Europe, which means that I'm an hour and a half, an hour and 45 minutes from everywhere in Europe. Now I've been to Paris and I've been to Germany. But since I've been here, since I've been inundated with work, I have not gone and I have friends who have offered me their homes. So I have, you know, I have, there are all kinds of people that have homes in Italy. In fact, May 2nd to the 11th, the woman I was telling you about that I danced with years ago, they have a home in Italy. Come be with us at our, you know, we have a wonderful place in Umbria. Tina, you got to come and then you can write, you know, in Italy. I have another friend. She's got a place in Barcelona. I have another well, friend. And you said you can write everywhere. So get on that train or that plane or go. <laughs> well, Alan, that's what I have to do. So I can, when you ask me, is there something that I haven't done? I haven't done the amount of traveling that I would like to. And so I do, I do have to, when I just gave the advice of just finish, yes, I have to just do it. So I'm hoping that I get on the other side of the six episodes uh, by May so that first things first, I can go to Umbria. I mean, the, go. <laughs> yeah, go, go, go. Is there, what's next after Shaka? I will, I will say it. You heard it here first. I'm writing another. I'm writing another musical, and uh, this one will be on Solar Records and the the rise and the demise and the uh, resurrection. 
uh, Dick Grippy and Solar Records. So I have been interviewing both here and in uh, and in LA. So many people were on that record label, you know. So we're talking the Whispers and Shalimar and Black Star and and the Silvers and all of those guys. And so it's going to be. I I, I really love that period in the music, you know, Soul Train into Solar. And well, so that's I can just hear all of that on stage. That will be wonderful on stage. It'll right. Be absolutely yeah. wonderful on stage. And I'm working with, remember, this is also the same company that gave Babyface his start, and but also, you know, Death Row Records. So can you imagine going from sort of bubblegum 70s um, type music to hip hop and rap? It's all there. And I'm having a marvelous time putting all of those pieces together. And I would like to um, to see that one go up after after shaka love that before i let you go uh since two musicals you're talking about do you have a favorite musical you've seen oh please yes i i listen in in descending order i saw mj on broadway i i, I need to see that i've heard it's phenomenal absolutely i just levitated out of my seat so for me in descending order mj Hamilton is just <laughs> to die for. We had we had what two two of the two of the performers from Hamilton here in London in Shaka Khan, wow. so it was great. Yeah, we they, we had to work around their schedules and and all of that, but it was it was just glorious. So loved Hamilton, and of course, then my third most favorite is the producers going. Now that that you know we go we have to go back twenty years there. Yeah, yeah. I, but, I and then the one after that would be Jersey Boys. So th there, there are a few of them. I, I tend to like um, jukebox musicals. Ain't Too Proud, I thought was great. You know, I thought Beautiful was great. Yeah. So yeah, I see everything. But when we, you ask about favorites, those are the my, ones. My friend was in Beautiful and the night we went to see him, Katy Perry was there. And it was fascinating, you know, to, to see somebody in, you know, in the 2020s, watching the woman who really paved the way for her. You know, it was just, I loved it. it you yeah, know. yeah, yeah. So, I, so I'll be going probably through the exact same experience again, because keep in mind, eventually I got to put the thing on its feet and sitting next to me will be Howard Hewitt and <laughs> Leon Silvers. <laughs> And those guys, Jeffrey Daniel, you know, those guys who were a part of the, the you know, of the, of um, those bands. That period, yeah. Yeah, I've interviewed uh, most of them. Babyface was, a, I'm, I'm waiting to interview him now. There is, is so much um, to that story that people don't really know. So it encompasses all of the things that I love about writing a musical. It's got the drama, it's got the, the comedy the great music, and of course, the, uh, the singing and dancing. Yeah. Tina, such a pleasure. I'm so glad we could do this. Thank you for joining me. I know it's late there. What, nine o'clock or eight? Uh, 10 after eight. 10 after eight. Thank you so eight. much. I still have another four hours to get writing done. So, <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Get a cup of coffee. <laughs> That'll be next. <laughs> <laughs> you have a lovely weekend. Thank you for spending this time with me. Thank you, Alan. Let's do it again sometime. Absolutely. Stay in touch. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you to Tina Andrews for joining us from London. Please join me on Tuesday when Guiding Lights Morgan England and his daughter Annabelle England who is a singer, songwriter, and DJ who was just nominated for the EDM Awards, Electronic Dance Music, for Best Dance Radio Artist uh, of the Year. And hear inspiring stories of overcoming addiction and achieving success from Annabelle and gain valuable insights on how we can all connect in a divided world from Morgan. If you haven't yet subscribed to my YouTube channel, you can do so down below. Turn on the notifications for reminders of all upcoming shows. And if you like today's episode, which I sure hope you did, click the like button. It certainly helps. And remember, if you like to stream audio versions, you can search the locker room on your favorite audio streaming platform. Have a great weekend, everybody. I'll see you Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. Have a great weekend. And please, as always, stay safe.